On Friday, July 26, 1996, the offices of Rocket Pictures, a producer-distributor of motion pictures and television programs, received a phone call. A male voice, identifying himself only as Victor, claimed to be in possession of a videotaped interview with an extraterrestrial being. Tom Coleman, president of Rocket Pictures, was intrigued enough to take the call. I, of course, thought this was some hoax. In fact, I, I thought it might have been my brother at one point. Uh, but as, uh, as we spoke, uh, this was someone who seemed to be very serious. Uh, we um, went back and forth on this, and I basically decided that, you know, this is a little bit too weird for me. Thank you, and goodbye. Um, as I hung up, uh, I had a very strange feeling that maybe, just maybe, there was something here. He said he had a tape of a space alien, an ET, that was being held in a military installation in Nevada, uh, I'm not sure as a prisoner <laughs> or a guest, um, and uh, he had this on tape. As we've already heard from Sean Morton and others, this is not the first time allegations have surfaced that the U.S. government is playing host to extraterrestrial biological entities, or EBEs. The first and most famous alleged contact was the Roswell flying saucer crash of 1947. This is the incident from which the alien autopsy footage supposedly originated. But there have been persistent rumors that not all of the aliens retrieved from the Roswell crash were dead. The final fate of the survivors, if any, is unknown. Two years later, however, in 1949, Another alien is reported to have survived a saucer crash, and this being, known as EBE-1, was taken into custody and kept at a safe house. EBE-1 supposedly suffered from chronic health problems, which the doctors of the time were helpless to treat. According to a controversial, possibly fraudulent briefing document dating from the Jimmy Carter administration, EBE-1 was interviewed by means of pictographs, from which it was learned that he came from the Zeta Reticula star system. Can we eliminate one or more of these categories from discussion? The laborious process of developing a set of symbols that could be used and understood by both human and alien amounted to the creation of a new language. If such an effort was made, it represents the greatest achievement in linguistics since the deciphering of the Rosetta Stone. That such an achievement would be kept secret illustrates the hysterical paranoia of the time as the Cold War intensified under the threat of nuclear annihilation. The so-called Carter Aquarius briefing document states that EBE-1 died of unknown causes on June 18, 1952. Skeptics who doubt the authenticity of the Carter Aquarius document find it unbelievable that highly advanced alien beings would allow one of their own to die under the primitive medical care of a species that had barely begun to conquer its own diseases. But as we will hear, there are those who claim that to the aliens, death is not a final end to be feared, but a mere transition. It was in the late 40s and early 50s that the U.S. government's policy toward UFOs was formulated. Publicly, there was Project Blue Book, which made a great show of gathering data on all the major UFO sightings, finally declaring them all to be hoaxes, mass hysteria, or swamp gas. But secretly, there may have been another policy at work. Over the years, several documents have come to light which seemingly confirm that a clandestine group, Operation Majestic 12 Group, a.k.a. MJ-12, 
was formed by special classified presidential order on September 24, 1947 for the express purpose of gathering information on UFOs and extraterrestrials, while at the same time keeping such information not only from unfriendly powers, but from the American public as well. If indeed Area 51 has become the nation's repository for alien technology and possibly alien visitors, then the extra-constitutional justifications for such secrecy were developed in the MJ-12 group's planning sessions. James B. Forrestal, Secretary of Defense under President Harry Truman, is widely accused of being the mastermind behind the creation of MJ-12. Once created, Majestic may have expanded its mandate beyond what Forrestal had intended. Whatever secrets Forrestal may have known concerning flying saucers and alien visitors, that knowledge died with him when in 1949 he mysteriously plunged to his death from a window at Bethesda Naval Hospital. Though he was being treated for depression, many UFO researchers doubt that his death was a suicide and point to the sinister workings of the possibly mythical MJ-12, which in their hypothesis may have been protecting its secrecy from a man who had come to believe the people had a right to know. As late as 1989, according to Bob Lazar, the identification badges at Area 51 read Madge for Majestic. In December 1994, a document purporting to be the Majestic 12 Group Special Operations Manual was leaked to a noted UFO researcher. It contains the following directive under the heading Isolation and Custody. EBEs will be detained by whatever means are necessary and removed to a secure location as soon as possible. There follows this disturbing amplification. Although it is preferable to maintain the physical well-being of any entity, the loss of EBE life is considered acceptable if conditions or delays to preserve that life in any way compromise the security of the operations. From the beginning of the UFO age, it seems, secrecy was always the government's prime directive. In 1988, another anonymous government source, codenamed Falcon, claimed that a second extraterrestrial biological entity, EBE-2, voluntarily became a guest of our government, allowing himself to be examined and interviewed. In this scenario, Area 51 became, for a time at least, a sort of extraterrestrial embassy, the setting for mankind's first attempt at diplomacy with beings from another world. Different sources disagree as to how communication was established. There is universal agreement that the EBEs are incapable or unwilling to speak human language. In addition to the pictographs used by EBE-1, it has been reported by Falcon that in the early 1950s, EBE-2 was fitted with some sort of artificial voice box, allowing him to speak words, and that he learned the English language very rapidly. Other sources doubt this story, however. By our kind, you mean we Americans? What has been reported most persistently is that the aliens communicate via thought projection, or telepathy. They would have been tortured, made to give up their secrets, instead of questioned in this friendly manner. We cannot be forced to communicate. Has it been tried? Not by us. We speak to who's ever willing to listen. The idea of telepathic communication with alien beings carries with it the same doubts and controversy attached to telepathy itself. Do the practitioners of this ancient art really have the ability to read minds? Or are they crafty charlatans who simply tell the listener what he or she wants to hear? If the cynics are right, then the self-proclaimed telepaths recruited by the government in the 1950s were playing an astoundingly daring hoax by claiming to speak for the mute visitors from the stars. Defenders of telepathy call this notion preposterous 
and point to the long history of government-funded research into mind reading as proof that their science has merit. In the last four decades, there have been persistent, often contradictory rumors and even eyewitness accounts of other alien visitors meeting secretly with military or government officials. But what about today? The Tester Corporation has recently come out with a model kit of Gray, the extraterrestrial life form, and a scale model of the so-called sport model, the UFO Bob Lazar says he studied at Area 51. This UFO kit has quickly become one of the most successful model kits in the history of the company.